Greetings from the Center of Concern in Washington, D.C. Jim Hugg and I are really delighted that you invited us into this project because it called us to go back and reread and rediscover Justice in the World. What a significant and timely document it is, truly prophetic. The issues the bishops analyzed in that document some 40 years ago are the same issues that we are grappling with today, except over these 40 years, they have become more severe and intractable. Maria's right. What they're dealing with in justice in the world 40 years ago are the same issues that we're dealing with today, only they're worse today. And their analysis is quite insightful and prophetic. Listen to some of the themes that appear very early in the document. This is number 12, but they're summing up discussions that have gone on on the pages just before this. They start off with the strong drive toward global unity. Globalization, that's what we talk about today. The unequal distribution which places decisions concerning three quarters of the income, investment, and trade of the world in the hands of one third of the human race. If you followed the papers at all, you know that that differentiation has only grown worse and worse and worse. People are driven into poverty. Fewer and fewer people control the wealth. The document also points out that it's the, the very nature of the technological economic system that we have that drives toward the consolidation of wealth in fewer and fewer hands. So it's a systemic problem we're dealing with. It's still the same today. Another of the themes is the insufficiency of merely economic progress. Today people in different places around the world are beginning to say we've come to the end of the model of development that has brought us to this stage. It's destructive, it only looks at economic progress, it only measures economic progress. That needs to be dramatically changed and that means we have to change the processes of development that we're about. And then the final theme they mention here, the new recognition of the material limits of the biosphere. Does that sound familiar? Not only climate change but the shortages of water and of key resources that we're seeing around the world. And at a later point, near the end of the document, they sum it up in a really powerful challenge that still rings today. We considered that we must also stress the new worldwide preoccupation, which will be dealt with for the first time in the Conference on the Human Environment to be held in Stockholm in 1972. 1972, on the environment. 20 years later, 1992, in Rio de Janeiro, the Earth Summit was a picking up of those same issues that needed still to be dealt with. 20 years after that, next year, 2012, there will be another gathering called Rio Plus 20 to try to deal with the same issues that have to be dealt with, have to be taken seriously, have to be addressed, and are still alive and very demanding today. And then they close with this challenge to us. It is impossible to see what right the richer nations have to keep up their claim to increase their own material demands if the consequence is either that others remain in misery or that the danger of destroying the very physical foundations of life on earth is precipitated. We face that challenge today. Those who are already rich are bound to accept a less material way of life with less waste in order to avoid the destruction of the heritage that they are obliged by absolute justice to share with all other members of the human race. In Justice in the World, the bishops faulted the development process that was going on in 1971, which was based primarily on 
economic growth for all the reasons that Jim has just outlined for us. At that time, the colonial powers had withdrawn from the countries of the South. But in the document, the bishops warn about a new form of neocolonialism, which we are experiencing today. And as we witness in both trade liberalization and the financial crises, which hold the countries of the South hostage, the bishops call for a new kind of development, one that accepts modernization insofar, and this is important, insofar as it really does address the needs of the countries of the South and the well-being of the people, rather than on profit maximization and wealth accumulation. Today at the Center of Concern, we are focusing on human well-being and ecological sustainability, what the feminist economists call the care economy, care of the human person and care of the earth. We also have a major project on trade and finance to ensure that both serve the needs of the people of the South. And we continue our history of education for justice. Regrettably, the development process has not improved much since the bishops wrote Justice in the World in 1971. But the issues before us today are so critical and so global, it is an imperative to us to review and redesign the development process. It's true at this point, um, sadly, that there is some pulling back by ecclesiastical leaders, some more conservative trends that don't want to take on the justice issues and want to refocus elsewhere. But when I see that, I remember a story that I was told by Phil Land. He's a Jesuit who worked at the Center of Concern the last 20 years of his life. But before that, he had been in Rome at the Pontifical Commission Justice and Peace. And he was part of the staff that helped to prepare the document, Justice in the World. And in his um, semi-autobiography, Catholic Social Teaching, as I have lived loathed and loved it. Uh, Phil tells a story about an encounter when they were preparing the document. They were getting it ready. They had the draft. And he had done a section in which he had written the church should not speak of justice unless it is itself perceived as doing justice. So they came to that segment of, of the document, and this high-profile cardinal <clears throat> sat up and said, <clears throat> there is no injustice in the church. And Phil said there was this, this kind of tense moment of quiet. And he said, I couldn't see anybody responding to that, so I got my courage up, and I finally said, well, Your Eminence, if we can't say that, I, I don't think we should have a document. And he said, that broke the ice. And all the others began to jump in and speak. And when it came to voting on that passage of the document, it was passed with only one dissenting vote in the committee. And when it went to the Senate itself, it was passed unanimously. So that's the challenge. That remains the challenge to this day. Unless the Christian message of love and justice shows its effectiveness through action in the cause of justice in the world. It will only with difficulty gain credibility with people of our times. That's still true. And the good news here is that it will gain credibility. We're seeing people walk away from the church because they don't accept the directions that it's moving. But they do respond to the call to justice and the mission and ministry of justice. And that's why we're glad to be able to celebrate the 40th anniversary of justice in the world. And we're glad to be part of a worldwide movement of people struggling to bring that message to new generations, to new ears, to continue in the work to transform our world.